This week on The Docket, Survivor Stories. Two women share their harrowing experiences at the hands of their abusers. One was her husband, the other her pimp since she was just 13 years old. How they rose above the tragedy and now help others break the cycle of violence. And how one of our own here at HCC is helping victims right here on campus. On The Docket starts right now. For the Hawk TV Broadcast Center in Ybor City, this is On the Docket with Felix Vega. Hello everyone, I'm Felix Vega and welcome to another edition of On the Docket. Today we're tackling domestic violence. It's a taboo subject for many, oftentimes ignored, oftentimes denied, and often repeated by abusers, sometimes with tragic consequences including death. Take a look at the cold hard facts behind the numbers according to the website domesticviolencestatistics.org. Domestic violence is a leading cause of injury to women, more than car accidents, rape, and muggings combined. Nearly one in five teenage girls who have been in a relationship said a boyfriend threatened violence or self-harm if presented with a breakup. Every nine seconds, a woman is assaulted or beaten in the United States, and more than three women are murdered by their husbands or boyfriends every day and up to 10 million children witness some form of domestic violence annually. These are all issues our panel has dealt with on various levels and even been to the darkest points of their lives before they emerged as survivors in every sense of the word. Joining me today exclusively on the docket, Valerie Miller endured years of abuse at the hands of her ex-husband before breaking her silence in 2007 when she learned he had killed his current girlfriend. Also joining us, Nichelle Rolfe spent most of her life as a prostitute on the streets for years all over the United States before she was stabbed in the neck by her last trick, then battled back to a brand new life. And Montage Hollis is the founder of a new domestic violence support group right here at HCC. Valerie, Nichelle, and Montage, thanks so much for joining us today here on the docket. Valerie, I want to start with you. This was a hard decision for you back in 2007 to really break your silence and now share your story, not only with your family, but everyone else. One simple question though, do you remember the first time that your ex-husband hit you and laid hands on you? Yes, I do. I'll never forget that day. Um, yeah, he slapped me and he pushed me and knocked me down. And I remember thinking, wow, what did I get myself into? And was there any sign before that first time that he was even that type of man? No, not before, no. Um, but after that, that's when he, that's exactly when it started. And what happened when it did start? It escalated over a period of time. Tell us about what you endured uh, in those first years. Yeah, the first years, I mean, it just started out just, you know, like angry words and pushing and slapping and um, beating and punching me with a close fist. And um, he used to just kick me around like I was just nothing but trash. And he would do it all in front of my children, my neighbors, and everything. So it escalated over years. He, he would always say he would never do it again, but he would still do it again. And when they did it in front of you and your children, um, what did that do to you emotionally? Wow, it tore me apart. But um, I, um, I was devastated. I hated to, uh, my kids to see me like that. But um, as long as he was beating me and not touching my kids, I was protective over my kids. So as long as he was beating me and not messing with my kids, you know, I was willing to go through it. And in those early years, did you ever um, blame yourself or did you ever think that, what am I doing that, you know, that's causing him to do this or what can I do better? Can I be a better wife? Tell us what that thought process was like. Yes, I used to think that all the time because a lot of times he used to tell me, you know, I was no good and nobody would want me and I was ugly or I was fat, I was stupid. Um, so after, you know, so many times of telling you that, you start believing that. And so I, my self-esteem got really low. Um, I started thinking I was, you know, ugly, one, attract, one isn't attractive, unintelligent, um, and it just devastated me, it just tore me apart. 
tell us, did you ever try and reach out to like your friends or your family when all this was going on? No. Why not? I, didn't. I just, I don't know. I, mo most of my part was fear and shame and guilt. You know, I felt like maybe I deserved it because he would tell me that, you know. But um, it was just mostly fear and shame. Was there alcohol involved on his part sometimes? Yes. And how did yes. that drive the situation? Oh, it made it worse. Um, he would be the nicest person if he wasn't drinking. As soon as he starts drinking, you know, that's when it would start. Um, he would come home and just start blaming me for everything that went wrong with his day and just start taking it out on me. So, yeah, alcohol played a big part in it. And over the years, um, there became, became a breaking point uh, for you. How long was it before you said, you know what, I need to get out of this relationship for myself and my children? Well, um, one time when I went to the doctor and the doctor said I was on a nerve, I mean, I was on the verge of having a nervous breakdown. So um, that time it just really, I started thinking, you know, I can't do this anymore. And then the next time he um, put his hands on me, he broke two of my ribs on one side. He fractured the other one. Um, he, I had two black eyes, both of my eyes was black. And uh, my nose, he had my nose bleeding. I went to the hospital and um, I just, it was just enough for me. And we're gonna come back to your story in a second, Michelle. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and bring you in. Your story of survivorship is uh, very different uh, from Valerie's. You actually started as a prostitute on the streets when you were, I believe, 13 years old? Yes, sir. And what was that like? I mean, that became, that was your normal um, life. That's all you knew? My normal thing was I came from a very dysfunctional family, so it was a lot of different things that went on in my life that ran me to the streets and ran me away from the family part of my home life into a fast world of living in the world of prostitution, drugs, alcohol, or whatever I could get my hands to do that kept me feeling I was safe instead of feeling I was in a bad situation where I was at home. Did you feel safer on the streets in that lifestyle than with your family even? Sometimes I felt safer outside of my home because it was so many different tragedies went on in my life because as growing up, um, I experienced um, rape within my family life with my cousin who raped me. My grandfather was one of my rape abusive ones. And I was also raped by several individuals outside of the home, like family relatives. When did that start? Um, we used to always have an open home, like an open house, like a, you know, a home to where all the cousins and all the family members used to come and stay all night. And like when I was little, we all just had to sleep in the same bedroom, in the same room, and people used to come over, and like my cousin, when they used to come over, they used to fund it with me and play with me and talk about it's going to be all right, you know, we can do this, we can play house, and you know, from that on, it went on from there. Wow, and then, so 13, you found yourself out on the streets, did you stay, um, and where did you grow up, actually? I stayed home up until like I was 17 years old but basically but doing family time in and out between my home and relatives and my grandfather was one of my abusers but he was like my best friend I was like his little pet pee and you know I went everywhere with him done everything I never knew anything was wrong at that time until I grew up and at what point did you when you were growing up tell take us through what it was like you're um, you were 17 uh, you move out and you're now in your 20s your 30s, what was going on in your life during that time? At that time, I was full blown. I was full gone. You know what <laughs> I mean? I was out there. I was, um, by that time, um, I didn't reach my peak in my life to where it was all about me and money. And everybody I dealt with, because back in that life back then, the money was so, you know, so easy to get. It was like Johns would come, they would give you two and three hundred dollars at one time, wow. four and five hundred dollars. You know what I mean? The drugs, they played a part, but they didn't play a bigger part until years down the road. Yeah, mostly it was about running and getting in the car, jumping in, robbing you real quick, and moving on and getting down out of the way. Wow. And when you, um, when the drugs started uh, coming into play, did that really change um, your perspective? 
I mean, how did that alter your lifestyle even? When George Nagy came into my life in a deep capacity, it just made me have to have more money because my habit became greater. Um, the lifestyle, you know what I mean? The tricks, you know what I mean? We're starting to get high with tricks and hang out with different men who used to want to go get drugs with them. So we might spend four or five hours sitting in a hotel or at their home while their wives at work, you know what I mean? And while their wives was at work, I would be in their home, you know, stealing all the wives jury and all of that different stuff or getting high with him and maybe giving him something more than what I had and, and leaving there with all his money. Wow. And um, at some points, did your, uh, the tricks or the pimps, did they abuse you um, as well as part of the whole dynamic? Um, during that seat life, it goes along with the territory. A lot of tricks used to take you in alleys, beat you down you know, with different things, you know, um, tell you if you don't give up your sex, you know what I mean? They would, they would take your money and rob you back. I didn't have tricks rob me back for my money. I already had them made already from other Johns. Um, I had guys pull tr um, knives to my throat. I had tricks put guns inside my mouth. I had them put them inside of my vagina. You know what I mean? Tell me they'll blow my whole insides out. I have guys put guns to my head. Tell me they'll blow all my brains out. I have tricks that didn't, didn't beat me too. I was bloody all over my face. I didn't have so many tragedies. And even with the pimp, they have locked me in the car with um, in trunks and left me there for dead. Um, the tr my pimp actually used to beat me, like for a low saying breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If I didn't come home with enough money or my quarter that I meet for that night, I would get beat up and I would have to stay out there on the streets all night. Some nights I was out there, if the streets was bad that night, I would be out there maybe two or three days if it just was like that. Oh my God. And you actually went to prison a couple of times. Um, did you feel safer in prison sometimes than being out on the streets? Sometimes I was ready to go. Sometimes just, just you know, you would just jump in anybody's car. And sometimes you knew who the people the police was. Sometimes after you've been out there so long, you actually knew that's the police. <laughs> you know, you just wanted to escape. Sometimes you'd be so high, you'd be up for days, and you're just ready to rest. So you, you yeah. would just set yourself up to get arrested? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes you weren't ready to get arrested, you know what I mean? Right. But then with some days you are because... All of the agony, all of the defeat, all of the purposes, you know what I mean? All of the drama, all of the chaos, you know what I mean? You know, I faced a lot of tragedies in my life that, you know, was just chaos. And when you, remember you tell me one story um, when you came and spoke to my class, actually, that uh, it got to the point where um, when you would, I think one of your pimps beat you up and then the other girls were waiting to like take care of you. Um, and like nurse you back to help to get get you back out on the street. How did that make you feel? Um, being when I was with the first pimp I was ever with, I was his bottom hole, which is the call the bottom um, madam of the family of the crew. And when all the other girls used to come in and actually be there with me, that kind of made me feel secure because I had relationships with them. And you know what I mean? We all used to sleep together and do things together. So I have been on both sides of the panel. I've been with women and as well with men. Wow. Um, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, wanna, we're going to bring back Valerie and Michelle Montage. I also want to bring you into the conversation because I think what you're doing is extraordinary here on campus. We'll be back with more of On the Docket right after this. Broadcast Center in Ybor City. This is On the Docket with Felix Vega. And welcome back to On the Docket. We're back now with more of our special panel this week about domestic violence. Valerie Miller and Michelle Rolfe are back with us again. Montage Hollis, I want to get to you. Uh, it's unusual because when I saw your flyer up in uh, the YPST building next door, um, I, I found it odd that a guy was starting a domestic violence a support group. Tell us about your group, first of all, and why you decided to start this group now. Our group is dedicated to forming a support group within HTC for those who have gone through domestic violence, who are going through it, who know those who have gone through it, and we try to spread out from there. Start from the home, 
work out from there, get to different shelters, spread out hotline numbers, and try to do as much good as we can because this needs get more coverage, needs get further out there. I am actually the second president. The first one, Amanda Jackson, started the club and I joined on as the secretary. And from there, we lost our vice president. So I stepped up and became vice president while doing my previous duties. Then from there, Amanda had to leave campus in order to go to USF. So and then you took over from there. And from there, yes, I became president. By that point, though, we were basically starting from the ground up, starting to recruit all over from the beginning, getting our club status reinstated from the beginning. And tell me about the domestic violence as far as it is your group that you're targeting here on campus. Are, is there a need for that? I mean, are the students coming to you? Is it What's your the audience that you're reaching or people that are coming to you and saying, you know, I need help, I'm in this situation, I don't know what to do? We haven't gotten as much of it this semester because it's unusual to see a male face for this type of thing, right. so people are more reluctant to come to me. But so far, I've gotten a call where a lady was trying to go to school, but her abuser is right here on campus, so she can't come here. So she called me asking for somewhere in South Carolina to find a shelter so that she could move up there with some family and go to school, get a better education. And that's actually right before you got me in touch with Valerie. And between both of us, she found a shelter that I could give her the emergency number four, the regular number four, and I've gotten that to her. So far, I haven't heard a response, so all I can do is hope that she's made her way up there. And Val, that was actually good to get the two of you together because you actually have um, your own ministry with Nichelle and a bunch of other groups. Tell us about what um, you all are doing in your group. Okay, our ministry is, is now called um, Courageous Voices for Christ. And what we do is we um, go and tell our past um, life. Um, we go to different conferences or we go to different schools or um, we're trying to go to different prisons and jails and everything to these women jails and um, just tell our stories and, and maybe it will help someone else. So that's what our goal is. And um, going back to your breaking points, because um, it's going to segue into another thing that I took away from your stories dealing with your children and family, but Val, you said that you were beat up so badly and went to the hospital. There was actually what you would term a guardian angel that came to you at the mm -hmm. hospital. Tell us about that and how she was able to help you out. Um, yes, they sent out um, two um, officers because of the situation that I was in. So it was a black female officer that came in my room and she knew my, my family so happened. She knew my sister, she went to school with my sister. So she was just, you know, giving me a list of numbers of different shelters that I can call for me and my children to go to and just different numbers where I can, you know, get help. And, um, and she was just telling me that I didn't deserve to go through what I was going through, that I came from a good family and, you know, and that they were going to pick him up and, you know, and that I need to find help for me and my children. And then you learned, um, you've actually separated from your ex-husband um, at some point, and then you learned in 2007 that he had actually murdered his current uh, girlfriend. When you found that out, why was that the, the breaking point for you where you needed to start telling your story? I just, when I got the call, I got the call from my daughter, and um, it was her father. And she called me to tell me that um, he, she, he had just murdered his girlfriend. And I was devastated. In fact, I was on my way to work. Um, and I just couldn't stop crying. I was just so devastated thinking that if I would have stayed in that situation, that would have been me. You know, it could have been me easily. Um, and I just felt like I just had to do something. It was just like a light bulb came on or something just happened. It just clicked inside of me. And so I started calling my family and telling my family that, you know, he had did this to me. And, and I just started getting it out there. And Michelle, your experience, that was your turning point. You actually had one of your tricks stab you. Tell us about that and how it led to you coming out on the other side. Um, 
One night when I was in the hotel with the pimp, um, the last one that I was with, because I was with four different pimps, but the very last one I was with, um, he told me that night, he said, I need you to go out and make some money. And I told him, I got a bad feeling something's going to happen tonight. So I went out anyway. And um, we went up into the club called Pink Pussycat in Miami, Florida. And that night when we went to the track um, out there on the streets, the actual John pulled me over, and when I was coming out of the pussy, pussy cat off of the track, he pulled me over and told me to come here, and when he, I turned around, he just started stabbing me. He just started stabbing me, and he was stabbing, my girlfriend was trying to help me, and he stabbed her, and he killed her. She actually died, died, died on the scene because he was stabbing both of us. He was stabbing her and was stabbing me, but he kind of got her in a place to where she just went down to the ground and I was still fighting, but he stabbed me seven times in my throat, seven times in my body, punctured my lungs, and all together when I got to the hospital, it was 18 times that he did stab me. But in that process, I did make it to the store. I walked to a 7-Eleven that was like right across the street. And when I got up there, blood just gushed out my throat. And that's when I fell down and the lady called 911. When the ambulance came, I was pronounced dead on the scene. Oh my God. But then they brought me back to life. And then when you were talking about your recovery, the last time that I spoke with you, and you couldn't even talk after this incident. You had to actually relearn how to speak again, how did you finally break out and say, I got to leave this lifestyle behind? I mean, you were almost dead. After that, I actually um, stayed in Jackson Memorial Hospital for almost three months because I was so tragically, beautifully, almost, you know, devastated out of death. And I had to stay there because they had to do a trach, a trachinomy in my throat, which I had a trach. And after I got out, my sister who lived in Washington, D.C. actually sent for me to go to D.C. So she took care of me while I was going through all of that. She fed me with how they feed me with the mouth by mouth because I couldn't really eat anything but liquids. And then she used to clean my tray, cleaning it out, making sure nothing happened to me. And then she set me up with a doctor there in um, Washington, D.C. in my, um, um, not Miami, but in Maryland with a specialist. And when I got to the specialist, the doctor thought I would never talk again. Wow. But what they did, they plugged it up. So I had to learn how to revoice and relearn how to retalk again. Amazing. Wow. And so, I mean, actually, your sister kind of like dragged you out um, and helped you recover. And your children, um, and also your new husbands, your latest husbands, has also been very positive influence in your life. Real quick, Valerie, let me start with you. Um, Lester, I know, is a, a big influence on your life. What was so different between him and your last husband that really helped you move forward and break through? He was more like my protector. I mean, he just, you know, took me in and just, you know, helped me to reveal my self-esteem and he helped me to raise up my girls. He's just a wonderful man and um, he just loved me. You know, he, he's always telling me how beautiful I am and and that I'm smart and I can make it and don't let nobody else tell you that any, anything different. Uh, he's just a wonderful man. And your daughter's yes. also been very supportive. Yes. Yes. And Michelle, I know you found a new a love of your life as well. As he does it, do done the same Even though you. my husband, I met my husband during my recovery because my husband is an ex-recovering addict as well. Mm -hmm. And we met in recovery. And when we met, we just hit it off right then and there. And for we we talked for a few days and we start got married two a couple of weeks later. You know what I mean? We really didn't get a chance to know each other because it was like bam bam. I was ready to and change you knew my it was life, the right one. and I knew he was the right one. And he went through all of the process with me to get my son back, my children back from out of um, DCF. You know, he was right there. He went through all of the um, parenting classes. He went through everything I needed to go to. He was there to support me. We used to catch the bus to go see my son at the um, children home out there and um North Tampa, New Tampa, and um, it was just awesome. He was just been there, and he's been there for me and my children ever since. That's fantastic. And Montage, I'm going to get to you before we wrap up. Um, if students or even, you know, faculty, anyone on campus needs help from your group, how do they get a hold of you? They can look for the advisor against domestic violence and situational occurrences and relationship. I've got flyers all over campus.
They can find them in the Ybor building. They can find them in the YPSC building. They can find them in this building. They can find them in the Student Services building. I have flyers all over. They can take my number off of there and contact me. And if they want to see me directly, then I'm usually in the courtyard from 1 p.m. to about 2, 3.30. And I try to make it out in the courtyard Thursdays from 12, I mean, 10 30 to at least 11 30. So if they want to see me directly, they can see me right there. And they can just give you a call too. And Valerie and Nichelle, your group, um, Courageous Voices, uh, you have a website? Yes, we have a website. It's www.nowlivingvictorious.net. Great stories, survival, wonderful, inspirational stories, I should say. Yes. Valerie Miller, Nichelle Rolf, Montage Hollis, thank you so much for joining us on the docket. That's going to do it for all of us this week on the docket. From all of us here at HCC, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.